More now of our special coverage here tonight, life in the U.S. in 10 years' time. By that time, there may be all kinds of new ways to safeguard and identify all those things that make each of us unique, our faces, even our fingerprints, even our eyes. Here now with more on the future of technology, NBC's Tom Costello. The year is 2017. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. The technology is based on answering one simple question. Am I who I say I am? So imagine two bullets are fired together more than a mile apart, striking each other head on at full speed. That's what scientists in Switzerland have now done, except they use subatomic particles moving at near the speed of light. And they say the success of this experiment using a Hadron Collider will now shed new light on the Big Bang and answer some of the most exciting questions about the universe. Michio Kaku is a theoretical physics professor, host of the new Science Channel series, Sci-Fi Science, Physics of the Impossible, based on his best-selling book, Nice to See You. I like that graphic there. We'll cue that up and roll that for you again. Okay. Okay. So you got this giant donut, right? Mm -hmm. It's being used to smash particles together right. to simulate the Big Bang from so many years ago. Mm -hmm. They worked on this sucker for 16 years. That's right. They finally did it, and you say it's only a pea shooter. Compared to <laughs> so, Mother Nature, right? <clears throat> well, look, 10 billion euros, the work of over 5,000 physicists over 16 years, and the machine is finally operational. And I say so it's a what? Great day. What does it do for us? Because we're going to unravel the secret of the Big Bang, where it came from, what happened before creation, what happened before Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and also maybe even answer eternal questions like time. Is time travel possible? Are there other dimensions? Are there parallel universes? We can get hints, glimmers of these cosmic questions with this machine. So you think we can figure out what happened before the... Big Bang. You think we can figure out whether or not time travel is possible That's because right. of what they're doing on the French-Swiss border? That's right. We're going to find not just particles. We're going to try to prove a theory called string theory, which is what I do for a living. String theory exists in 10, 11-dimensional hyperspace and other dimensions. And it actually says that maybe our universe was created by the collision of two other universes. And maybe our universe is a bubble of some sort, and there are other bubbles out there, other expanding and contracting and what bubbles. What these other bubbles mean to you? These are other universes where perhaps there could be other laws of physics. I mean, this is huge. Really? This is greater than the Copernican Revolution when we realize that there are stars and... and Holy... And Well, we've been bringing you on for three years. You've never talked like this before. Well, this is what I do for a living. Some people think it's too hard to understand, but I think the average person can realize, hey, these are words you hear in Star Trek, right? Uh -huh. These are concepts you hear, but no one ever works on these things. That's why, that's what the Large Hadron Collider So you, comes you're in. putting this up there with Sir Isaac Newton and gravity. Mm -hmm. You're putting that up there with Thomas Edison and electromagnetism. That's right. You're putting that up there with Albert Einstein. And E equals MC squared, which led to nuclear power. Right. That's what you're writing about today in the Wall Street Journal. That's it's right. that it's, significant? It's that big. We're talking about unifying all the forces of nature. There are four forces that make the world move. Each time a force was unraveled, it unleashed the Industrial Revolution. The our world. On the horizon is coming the day of our Lord, and today's program helps you prepare as you live in touch with Jesus Christ. Tribulations and trials and persecutions have always been familiar terms to the body of Christ, that is the church. In fact, they have sort of been our traveling companions all the way through. 
In fact, if you will take your Bible and begin with the book of Acts, that you'll notice that in the very beginning, with the very first miracle, persecution of the church began. In fact, if you read the entire book of Acts, you'll find that there's persecution from beginning to end. And for the first 300 years of the Christian faith, Roman emperor after Roman emperor did his very best to destroy the Christian faith. One after the other tried to obliterate the whole idea of following Christ and the church. And so we think about persecutions and trials and heartaches as just the natural normal part of being a believer. But in the 24th chapter of Matthew, and I want to ask you to turn there, in the 24th chapter of Matthew, there is a verse of Scripture that relates to a type of persecution and tribulation and trial that is different from all of these because all of this tribulation has been primarily man against the body or man against man. But you recall in this 24th chapter of Matthew, which is one of the most important chapters in the Bible concerning Bible prophecy, you remember that in the 21st verse, Jesus said, for then shall be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall be. In fact, he says it is going to be so bad that unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. And what we want to talk about in this message is the great tribulation. Now, more than likely, you've heard such words as Armageddon, the second coming of Jesus Christ, uh, the rapture of the church, and things like that. And maybe the word or the term, the, the great tribulation, was not so familiar. But every believer who wants to understand the Word of God must understand that the great tribulation is not something that may happen. That is, man can't get so good, and things are not going to improve to the point that one of these days God will say, well, I'm just going to skip that part. There's not going to be any great tribulation. Things have improved so much because the truth is things are getting worse and worse. And no matter how good they may look in spots, the Bible says that God gave to John on the Isle of Patmos this revelation of things which would come hereafter. He didn't say they may come. He didn't say they, they might. He didn't say if certain conditions happen, they would. He says this is what you can look to because it is going to happen. And so, beginning in the sixth chapter of the book of the Revelation, God unfolds for us in the series of three sevens, uh, the time of the great tribulation. And what I would like to do to make this as simple as possible is to answer some questions concerning this period of time in which man will experience not just tribulation, not persecution, not simply warfare and bloodshed, but what the Bible calls the great tribulation that Jesus spoke of in this 24th chapter. What is it going to be like? This is what he said. Look in this 24th chapter. What it's going to be like in verse 21, he says, There will be a great tribulation such as not has occurred since the beginning of the world until now or never shall be. That is, the nature and the intensity of this tribulation period is going to be such there has never been anything previously like it. There will not be anything in the future like it. That is, there will ever, not ever be anything to match this period of suffering and judgment because of the nature of the judgment. And if you'll notice what he says in verse 22, he says it's going to be so intense and so terrible. He said, even, even the elect, look at this, and unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those God's going to save, he says, even they wouldn't have made it. He says it's going to be cut short. It's going to be so intense. So we're not talking about just another time of persecution, but a definite, specific time of persecution and judgment that is ordained by Almighty God with some very specific purposes for allowing it to happen. Man's war against each other, bloodshed and persecution, oftentimes it's because of his prejudice, because of his, his hatred, his animosity, a desire for power and so forth. This judgment is God's judgment upon the earth for some very, very specific reasons. Now, if you will ask the question also, what about the time of this event? Well, in order to understand biblical prophecy properly, you have to not only involve the 24th chapter of Matthew and others, but all the way back to the book of Daniel and the Revelation. So when you put Daniel, Matthew, and Revelation together, you get the most comprehensive, complete view of what God is going to do in future times. 
But in brief, simply this, the great tribulation period, because it has a very specific purpose for which God is going to allow it, is a time of seven years. When you look in the book of, the, in the book of Daniel and his prophecy, he shows us even back in those days, hundreds of years before and even before now, thousands of years before the tribulation period, he told us exactly how long it's going to last. It is going to be a time of tribulation for seven years. Now you say, well, seven years, why seven years? Well, seven is certainly a, a symbolical number for completeness in the Word of God, and so more than likely uh, that may be part of it, but God in a seven-year period is going to accomplish his purpose of judgment upon the earth. Then the question comes is who uh, will be in this tribulation period? All we have to ask is at this point is what happens immediately before that? And if you'll turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Paul is writing to the Philippian Christians or the Thessalonian Christians, and uh, they are, have been asking him some questions about what's going to happen to our loved ones who passed on before when Jesus comes. And they had lots of questions about these things. And so he said at that time, I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, those who've already passed on in the Lord, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. He uses the term fallen asleep for Christians who passed away. But this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until, until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those in the resurrection who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain on earth shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What is going to happen previous to the tribulation period? Before God unleashes his awesome judgment upon this earth, he is going to take away his body. We call that the rapture, the snatching away, the taking away. That word does not happen to be uh, in the Bible, in the English, the rapture, but that is exactly what's going to take place. He says that the body of Christ, his bride, is not appointed to wrath. And so you see, people who say, well, I believe Christians are going to have to go through the tribulation to get cleansed. Let me ask you a question. You think about this. What is it that cleanses us, tribulation or what? the blood of Jesus Christ. So the tribulation, the purpose of the tribulation is not to cleanse the church. What cleanses the church is the body of Christ, which is the blood of Christ. You remember he says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is continually cleansing us from all sin. It is not tribulation that cleanses his body. It is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the body of Christ, the Christian does not have to go some, through some tribulation period to suffer in order to get clean because we were cleansed with the blood of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Our sins were atoned for once and for all. We're not going to some place to suffer and we're not going to remain here in this life to suffer because we have already been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he says he has made us holy and made us righteous. Therefore, we are not going through the tribulation period. So that if the Lord Jesus Christ were to come and take away all of his church at this very moment, every single believer, including every baby and every person who has not reached some age of accountability, where they'd be accountable to God for their, for their belief and conduct, God's going to take all of us away. And what's going to be left? What's going to be left is who is going to be here uh, during this time of the Great Tribulation. So that brings us to this question, and that is, who will be here when the time of the Tribulation comes? Well, we know that every single believer is going to be taken away, so who's going to be left? Who's going to be left? will be unbelievers. That is, those people who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that will be, of course, multitudes of millions and millions and millions of people. But during that time, of course, of the tribulation, there will be others, and that will be those who are saved during the tribulation period because there will be those who receive Christ as their Savior during that time. If you'll turn to Revelation chapter 7, and I want us to look at a couple of verses here uh, in this seventh chapter of the Revelation. And if you look there for just a moment, let's look at uh, verse 3 and 4, first of all. You recall in verse 3, he says, 
do no harm, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Now remember, the tribulation time starts in the sixth chapter. So the tribulation time is beginning now, and he says before this happens, he says before this judgment falls, he says there must be a sealing. Now what is this sealing? Look in verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. What is God going to do? During this tribulation period in the very beginning, there will only be those people here who are lost, those who rejected Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. God is going to seal 144,000 Jews, as he says, 12,000 out of each tribe. That's nothing symbolical about that. It's very uh, simple and very clear. He says he's going to save a remnant of the nation of Israel because his kingdom here on this earth will be populated not only with Gentiles but also Jews. And so what does he do with these 144,000? Who are they? More than likely, these 144,000 Jews are those Jews who have been looking for the Messiah and with all the knowledge that they have, whatever knowledge that they would seem to have, they are looking and expecting for the Messiah. God is going to seal them, making them his own, revealing the truth of who the true Messiah is. And what is going to happen is they are going to scatter all over this world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only to Jews, but also uh, to Gentiles alike. And so he says in this third and fourth verse. Now, go back to Revelation chapter 7 again and look at something else I want you to notice a little later on in this chapter. He says, beginning in verse 9, After these things, seeing these 144,000, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation, all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches, were in their hands. What is he saying? Not only is he going to save 144,000 Jews, sending them out like as missionaries all over this earth, but out of every tongue and every tribe and every nation, every people, people are going to be saved. Now, you say, well, what about those tribes uh, that do not have a, a written language yet, a known language yet? Well, uh, if the Lord Jesus Christ were to come tonight, there are many of those languages uh, like people like that and tribe. You say, well, how are they going to hear? Now, this is one time that I would believe in absolute speaking in tongues because what they would do, they would speak in a language that those people in those tribes and those nations could understand the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... I don't know how they would know, and it may be that by the time all this happens, every tribe and every tongue will know, but if they don't, it doesn't make any difference. God will enable those missionaries to speak, those evangelists to speak the language of those tribes and those people so that they too will know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and they will come to a saving knowledge of Christ because he says, out of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people, there will be people there. In fact, he sees this already in the book of the Revelation, as he foresees the future things, there will be people in heaven from every single nation on the face of this earth. Now, how are they saved? Well, how are they saved? They are saved, first of all, because God chooses this 144,000. He saves this remnant. If you look in this 24th chapter, and here's a verse that oftentimes confuses people. If you look in the 24th chapter of Matthew, in the 14th verse, people read this and say, well, you can sort of figure out when Jesus is coming. No, you can't. Now, here's what this means. This whole chapter is about tribulation time. And so he says in the 14th verse of Matthew 24, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. What is he referring to? He is referring to the gospel of the kingdom that will be preached during this tribulation period. As, it, as, the, as these people are scattered all over the world, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and as people say, they begin to share with their friends and their neighbors. All over the world, the gospel is going to be preached. He says it's going to be preached in the whole world. There's not any tribe or nation of people who are going to miss it. And when it is done, he says, then the end shall come. That is the end of the age. Then the Lord Jesus Christ is coming in his glory and in his power, which is also stated here in the 29th uh, uh, verse of this chapter. He says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, 
the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of the sky to the other, and then all of God's judgment shall be consummated in his destruction of the earth. And so, we are talking about a time of great tribulation, a time when people are going to be saved in, in the midst of all this. Now, the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament a certain way. He works in this age of grace another way. More than likely, in the tribulation period, He may work as He did in the Old Testament. No one can say that, but the Spirit of God is going to be working. So how are they going to be saved? God is going to seal some, sending them out preaching the gospel of Christ. The Holy Spirit will be convicting, convicting them of their sin. How will they say? The same way you and I are saved, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not going to be any other method of salvation. There never has been. There never will be there's only one way. In the Old Testament, they were saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they shed the blood of those lambs and bulls and goats and all the rest, they trusted God, Jehovah God, to forgive them of their sin because that blood was symbolical of the atonement. When Jesus Christ came, he satisfied ultimately and forever and eternally the atoning death of Jesus Christ was God's eternal satisfaction for all the sin of mankind, paying the sin debt of all men. Therefore, in the tribulation period, people are going to be saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back to that seventh chapter again, and look, if you will, in the 14th verse. In the 14th verse, you'll notice he says, And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There's only one way to be saved, by the blood of Christ placing your trust in Jesus Christ and His death at Calvary to atone for all sin. So this is the way they're going to be saved. Now, somebody says, but now wait a minute, now hold it a second. All of a sudden, here is the world operating as it is today. You have all these lost people out here doing their thing. You've got the people in the church doing their thing. Suddenly, Jesus comes and all the body of Christ, all believers are taken away. Well, if they're all taken away, when this 144,000 begin to preach the gospel, well, those people uh, who rejected Christ before uh, the church is taken away, then they'll get a second chance. No, they won't. They will not get a second chance. I want you to turn to a passage of Scripture that I think is very significant dealing with this. In 2 Thessalonians, turn to 2, Th 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I do not believe that those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, while they have had the opportunity to hear it, can reject Him and reject Him and reject Him. Jesus come, take away His body, and then they say, Oh, oh yes, I remember now. No. Listen to this passage, if you will. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because, listen to this, they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be, as to be saved. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Those people who have rejected, laughed at, mocked, and persecuted the church. So what are we talking about? We're talking about those people who did not hear the gospel of Jesus Christ who are going to be saved in the tribulation period. Uh, those people, for example... Out there are multitudes and millions and millions of people who never knew the truth like you and I know it. As these missionaries absolutely cover this earth preaching the gospel, teaching the Word of God, multitudes and multitudes of people are going to be saved. But those who've gone to church and those who've listened to the gospel and those who've criticized the church and persecuted the church and, and shunned God, Jesus Christ, the Bible, and mocked it all, no, they won't. There's no sign of a second chance for them, nor is there a second chance for those who die. And on the other side, oh, they say, oh, now I understand. None of that. This is why, listen, this is why it is dangerous to listen to the gospel. This is why to hear the Word of God and to hear somebody open the Word of God and to read the Scriptures and to explain how to be saved and to explain it simply and to offer you the privilege of being saved and then you to turn it down, shut it off, reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, it is a dangerous thing to hear the gospel and say no to the invitation of Almighty God to receive His love 
so that you in turn can receive his forgiveness and in turn begin to love him and fulfill his purpose for your life. So you, 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 can, you can shun the Word of God. You can turn it down. You can reject the Lord Jesus Christ, but not without great penalty. And I trust and hope that if you have in the past, that my friend, you will take a second note that, listen, there is only one way to be saved, only one way to be accepted in the eyes of God, and that is through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ at Calvary. On the other side of the rapture of the church, when God takes His body away, if you've heard it and you heard it with understanding, you will not get another chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the purpose of this time of tribulation? Is it because God's just angry at the world? Is it because he's just angry at mankind? That he's fed up and his patience, have, his patience has run out and therefore he says, that's it. I'm drawing a line. It's all over. My judgment's coming. That is not what God has in mind at all. God has several purposes for allowing this judgment to come. And when you read that 6th through the 19th chapters of the book of the Revelation and he speaks of the trumpet judgments, the seal judgments, the vile judgments, I mean the awesome, awful things that are going to happen, which we'll come to in a few moments. When you ask the question, why would God allow all this? Why would he send such judgment? What we forget in this world of wickedness and vileness and sinfulness is that God is a holy God. And God is going to vindicate his holiness. And God is not going to look, overlook sin. Even when you and I sin against him and we ask him to forgive us, that doesn't mean that God just winks and says, okay, remember this, that every single time you and I are forgiven of a single solitary sin, it is only because his son died at Calvary, took our sin debt with him. He paid it in full. There is no such thing as simply being forgiven because you're confessing it. Confe Listen, forgiveness of sin doesn't come by confession and doesn't come by repentance. Forgiveness of sin comes through the death of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And when I, in confession and repentance of my sin, come to him, acknowledging my need of him and acknowledging that his death paid my penalty, then I'm forgiven. All the confession, all the repentance and all the works and all the good things that you could possibly do will never bring salvation. It is because Jesus died and paid our sin debt that makes it a reality. And so when we come to this time of great tribulation, we ask the question, well, why? First of all, God is going to judge the nation of Israel. These are his chosen people. Listen, they were his chosen people. They are still his chosen people. It doesn't make any difference how awful they are, how unbelieving they are. They're still his chosen people, and there is a remnant that God says he is going to save because in his kingdom there will be a great remnant of the nation of Israel. But his judgment is coming upon them. What is he coming for? Because it is coming to get them ready for the coming of the Messiah. Now, you and I know that the Messiah has already come. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he came as the Messiah. He says in John chapter 1, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Who were they? They were the Jews. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. So while he came primarily and first of all to the nation of Israel, we have received the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. The body of Christ, the church is established. This is why in all the Old Testament prophecies, there is, there is no prophecy of the church age. This is that age between the prophecies of the Old Testament and the judgment of God. You don't see the church age. This is the age of grace when God has chosen to, to save Gentiles. And therefore, first of all, he's coming to get the nation of Israel ready for the Messiah. That is, when these 144,000 begin to share, to share the gospel, what is going to happen is their message is the message of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is coming. The Messiah is coming. It is the person of Jesus Christ. It is the Christ taught by the church that's gone. That Messiah is our Messiah. It is his death at Calvary that makes it possible for us to be saved. He did fulfill all the sacrificial symbolism. He is the Messiah, and he is our Savior. He's coming to get ready the body of, that, that is the nation of Israel. Secondly... His judgment is coming upon the Gentiles. You'll notice we read a few moments ago in that seventh chapter of Revelation that out of every tribe and nation and tongue and people, there will be Gentiles there also saved. God is going to judge this wicked, vile uh, world of ours that has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And you think about it. Today, uh, our goal is to get the gospel in every nation on earth. And every single day out of this place, we preach the gospel in every single nation on the face of this earth. Our goal now is to get it into every major city on this planet. Why? Because God says 
that he is going to save people out of every tribe and tongue and nation. What is our responsibility? The same responsibility he gave those disciples in those early days. As you go, he said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you all the way even to the end of this age. Could you imagine that they would have thought 2,000 years later that somebody would be saying the same thing and quoting the same scripture that Jesus gave them? 2,000 years have passed, and what's happened? The grace of God, the patience of God, the love of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God is being preached. It is being preached all over the world. Because God desires to save men. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ is wide enough, broad enough, deep enough to include anybody, everybody. And all a person has to do is to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that his death at Calvary took care of their sins. Yielding themselves to him, they become a child of God. His judgment is coming upon this Gentile world. And you think that in this nation of ours, anybody who wants to hear the gospel can hear it. And in many other nations, more and more, the gospel is being preached in these nations. Why? God is fulfilling His great commission. He is, he is going to keep His word in every tongue, every tribe, every nation. And see, no matter who you are and what you are, every single one of us has the responsibility of sharing the gospel in some form or fashion, whether it is across a desk, behind a pulpit, in a choir, it doesn't make any difference where. In your business, that's what the church is all about. The church isn't all just about praise. The church isn't all just about service. The church is about evangelizing the world, sending out missionaries, getting the gospel out there. The kingdom of God is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. And our mission is to get that message of the redemption of Christ into the heart and soul of every single living human being on the face of this earth. And any church that is not involved in evangelism missions has missed their whole purpose for existence. God's judgment is coming upon the Gentiles. Likewise, for example, that God's judgment is coming upon Satan. It's coming upon Satan's work on the face of this earth. The Bible says that he calls himself the God of this age. Now, there is only one God, and that's Jehovah God, Elohim. Absolute in faithfulness, infinite in power. There's only one true God. Satan, who decided and tried to be God, got thrown out of heaven. And in this earth, he's acting like God and trying to be God. And every once in a while, you look around, you think, who's winning? Is Jehovah winning or is Satan winning? Jehovah has already won. That's not even a question. Satan is playing havoc and harassing God's people and doing everything he can to destroy everything that has any semblance of God whatsoever. God's judgment is coming upon Satan. When you read that 20th chapter, the Bible says that he is thrown into the pit, but for a thousand years he's going to be changed, let loose, and ultimately he and the false prophet and the beast are going to be thrown into the time of torment forever and ever, he says, the smoke of their torment shall rise, which means that for all eternity, while you and I are enjoying in heaven and all the saints of God, Satan is going to be suffering for eternity for attempting to be God and destroying everything that is godly on the face of this earth. So God's judgment's coming. And when it comes ultimately at the second coming of Christ, he's going to destroy this earth as you and I know it, and he's going to make it absolutely perfect once again. Now, whether it's going to be like the Garden of Eden or not, I don't know about that, but it is going to be absolutely so perfect as that. God is going to destroy everything that is wicked, everything that is sinful, everything that is vile, everything that is ungodly and unholy. He is going to send his judgment. It is going to be so absolutely complete there will be nothing left but that which is good and that which is like God. So these are the things that he has in mind and the purposes for sending his judgment uh, in this time of the great tribulation. Now, so what we have to ask is this. What are conditions going to be like? That is, uh, wh what's going to happen uh, when... Uh, what, what's, what's it going to be like in the tribulation period? I want you to think about something for just a moment. Let's say that here we sit today, and uh, when you left your home today to, to come to church, you left it like you normally do, and you drove your automobile, and some of you flew in from some of the states to visit our church. And, and so I want you to think about what's going to happen if suddenly at this second, the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we which are alive are caught up to him to be with him in the clouds, to ever be with the Lord in the air. He says, it is in the twinkling of an eye, fasting you bat your eye. So there's not going to be any getting ready, not going to be any going home, straightening things out. Friend, when you, listen, when you, you better be ready because it's going to be too late if you're not. There's not going to be any getting ready. Now, I want you to think what will happen. Let's think about it for just a moment because, you see, what I want to talk about in a few moments, all of this is setting the stage for it. 
All of a sudden, Jesus comes and every believer is taken away. You can take every single facet of society and all of a sudden, every single believer will disappear. Imagine the chaos. Imagine the confusion, the mystery of it all. Imagine the anchor folks on television, radio, getting on and saying something unusual has happened. Unusual, you better believe it'll be unusual. Only those who are lost will be left. And they're going to be blinded, so they're not going to know what's going to happen. So can't you imagine what it would be like for them to try to explain that millions and millions and millions of people all over the world have suddenly disappeared? Some of them may be smart enough to say, I think I remember hearing something that some preacher said about some rapture, some snatching away. Listen, you're talking about getting out the Bible, it'll be too late. But they'll be getting out the Bible to find out if they can get some, uh, some little love. Something to hang their next program on, or something scriptural, it'll be too late. Because all of us will be gone. But imagine what would happen. You think about the crime, and the violence, and the bloodshed that'll take place when all the believers are gone and your house is empty. And there's nobody to answer the alarm system. Think about what would happen in cities, big cities across this nation, little towns. When all of a sudden, the wicked, the lost, realize that all the Christians are gone. And it looks like they're gone for a while. They didn't come back last night. And um, they're, not, they're not here today. And you know what's going to happen? Can you imagine what kind of awesome army of violent people will penetrate homes and sack everything, get everything they want? They'll think they've died and gone to heaven. That it's all there for them. Money, jewelry, guns, boats, trailers, all those things that you prize that you had to leave behind. They're going to get it all, so you might have, listen, you might as well give it up to God already and enjoy it all you can, but don't, don't, don't worship it because somebody else is going to get it. But they're not going to be able to.